Yeah, I'm live streaming it. No, I can't. I can't. I'm live streaming. I'm live streaming. Well, it's just started. <laughs> I I think you've already said hi. Right. Uh, my channel. Ah, excellent. Right, I've got chat back. Mum says hi, by the way. Uh, I'm sure you guys gathered that. Uh, right, okay. So, hold on. I need to post a link to this on Reddit. Where... Where is my... Ah, copy video URL. Here we go. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I've decided that actually posting on Reddit is good for, <laughs> for publicity. Like, I mean, obviously it is, but I hadn't done it. And the number of people looking at my channel, like not just watching the streams, right? Like the number of people looking at the videos and following the project has just like slowly declined because it's got no, uh, like barely any publicity, right? Um, let me see. Uh, right. Come on, GitHub. You can do it. Uh, right, just need a, oh, I could have figured out this URL anyway. Right. Boom. Let's see what happens. Right. Excellent. Okay. Got chat up. I've got big text as well. Um, because, you know, like I, I, I figured that, that having stuff tiny on my screen is, is all very well for me, um, but it's going to be quite difficult to look at. So basically, long time no stream. Um, hold on, I'm going to shut my curtains behind the camera. It's a bit disconcerting having a black window. Anyway, right. So basically, long time no stream, and I, I just like haven't worked on Sapling. Um, I have too many other projects um, that, that are going on right now, and most of them are in Rust as well, which means that like you know at, at the end of the day I'm just like oh yeah, I, I'm kind of done with <laughs> Rust coding. Um, but I have an idea right, which is that the arena allocator that we have. is, well, it's complicated, right? And it adds a lot of complexity to the code. And I was watching uh, Vintergutton Wednesdays, not sure if anyone else has heard of it, shout out, it's a really good channel. Um, and the, it's about a, a dude, a, a musician, who's building a, a music playing machine that uses marbles, right? So it drops marbles on instruments in order to make them play music. Uh, and, one of the things that he's done recently is had a load of like kind of design rebuilds of parts of the machine refactoring I guess <laughs> you could say um but it's just like I, I, and his kind of mantra right now is the best part is no part hence hence the video um so basically uh, the idea is that if you have a problem with something uh, and this is quite a good lesson in whatever type of engineering you're doing uh, if you have a problem then you could fix the problem, right? You could add something to your thing that you're building in order to fix the problem, like to kind of patch the problem. Or you could change something about how the, the, the thing you're building is structured so that the problem disappears, right? So the, the best way of fixing a problem is to remove it. Um, and like, obviously that's more difficult. Sometimes you can't. Um, but in this case, there's been a load of... Um, in fact, user suggested design changes 
uh, to the, the marble machine that have just like removed loads of problems. Like not, not even fixed, removed. Um, so they're just like not even problems anymore. They just can't exist. Um, and when I was doing this, um, like when I was thinking, uh, so I have another project as well, which um, involves a lot of like tree-like data structures that get edited. Um, and I was going to go down the arena allocating route and then I suddenly had a realization that, wait, what we need is reference counting, right? We, because uh, the thing about the arena is that arenas are great if you allocate a load of things slowly and then deallocate them all in one go. Like alloc arena allocators are really fast for that. Um, but that's not really what Sapling's doing, actually, because sure, quite a lot of stuff will be deallocated at the end, but you'll get quite a lot of deallocation as you're going. Um, because you, you don't want to hold a really long undo history, so you'll be dropping stuff off the end. Um, and, like, literally this is what RC does. Um, the only complaint I had was that I thought RCs were mutable, and in fact they're not, which is obvious because you can clone them arbitrarily, and that would completely break uh, Rust's pointer al aliasing. Um, so... What are we doing? Okay, so basically, the, the point of the stream was I was like, oh, I, I haven't seen this code base before. Um, let's just do some simple refactoring um, and see, see what happens, right? You can't lose anything, um, I think. Yes, excellent. Could a ring buffer be used for the undo history? I have not heard of ring buffers. Um, well, let's just summon a Firefox window. Oh, circular buffers, okay. Um, yes, it could. The, the problem more was that, um, the, the problem that the arena allocator is trying to solve, right, is that uh, Sapling is a syntax tree editor. In fact, um, we could just run it to show what it's doing. Um, so basically, instead of, um, like, it's a code editor rather than a text editor, right? So instead of having some text that you edit, um, instead you have the syntax tree um, and you select nodes on the syntax tree, right? So at the moment we're, we've selected this root here um, and we can move around the syntax tree uh, with keyboard shortcuts and then we select different nodes. Um, so kind of implicitly selecting this also selects the contents, right? That's not clear yet with the way it renders currently. Um, ideally, it would kind of highlight these a little, but you get the idea, right? So then I could do something like I could move down to here and then, I don't know, replace this with false. And it would know that I mean like this section of the code rather than like me figuring out which lines need to be replaced. Um, and hopefully this is just like a more more natural way of editing code. Um, but the issue is that we end up basically, every time we do an edit, we end up rebuilding a tree, right? So we have like loads and loads of syntax trees and they're largely duplicated. Like when I did this replacement, I didn't change true and false, right? And these could be, true and false could be huge branches of the tree, right? Like imagine, um, big source files, they'll have huge branches, right? Um, so I don't want to clone, um, I don't want to do any kind of cloning for um, those nodes. So I, I want to lazily just keep pointers back to say, oh yeah, well, this whole branch that I didn't change is still there because I didn't change it, right? Um, so yes, a ring buffer would be really good for storing the roots, right? So it, it would store which root nodes we have at every point so that we can recurse down the tree when we want to move backwards, right? Um, but the thing is that I had this arena allocator, right, which is where we stored all of the nodes. Um, because there's, at this point, they, we need multiple ownership because um, the root nodes, like all of the root nodes in our undo history, so like every step of the chain, has to own its tree. Or, or at least it either borrows its tree or it owns it. Um, Yes, yeah, the ring buffer's cool. I hadn't, um, I hadn't thought of that as a way of doing it. Um, I was just going to use vex and then just like horrendously 
like linear time pop off the front. Um, I, I mean, at the moment, Sapling never forgets about stuff. Um, but it's still a problem because you can go back, um, you can go back in time and then make a change. And then that will drop all of the redo history that you now don't have. Um, and at the moment, that has no effect on memory usage, which is a bit frightening because you could you could have huge amounts of stuff there. Um, so pretty much, I think the arena is literally just doing RC, um, is the upshot that I had. That, like, that, that was the, th the thing I came to. And that it would actually just be a benefit all round to replace the arena allocator with RCs. Um, so therefore every, um, every node, instead of, uh, where, where's uh, node? Or is it, it's AST JSON is the, the concrete version. Uh, yeah, so this is this is like a, a syntax tree node um, for for the, the, the for the type of JSON, right? Um, so it is it is called JSON, and you'll notice this lifetime here, um, and this is because all of the uh, all of the nodes are stored in the arena allocator. Um, because that way they're all owned by something else. So they always borrow their children, right? So an array, uh, an array is an array and it has a vec of its children, right? And these are arena lifetimed pointers. Oh, thanks. Um, I mean, I, I try to, <laughs> I, I try to explain what I'm doing as I go along, um, because like, you know, obviously I don't when I'm coding on my own, right? Because <laughs> that's like the last thing you want to do is to think out loud. Like, can you imagine if like every all programmers thought out loud? Um, but it's kind of like, yeah, I, I have to be in a different mindset when streaming, which is a bit like... That's, oh, okay, yes, that's a good idea. Um, so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I should have done that. Um, Yeah, so pretty much like the, the idea is that we would we would the arena would own everything and then all we'd have to do is to store pointers. Um, because the thing is, I don't want like some weird key value store where you store like numbers and then have to load them every time um, because we're not really doing a whole lot of modification. Right. Modifying is like not a very common operation. Right. What we're wanting to do a lot more is to like recurse down the tree to do operations or whatever. Um, or to render it to the screen. So we really need uh, running, like uh, we need recursing down the tree to be fast and edits don't have, they need to be fairly fast, but not super fast. Um, so pretty much it would be really nice if we could just say RC here. Uh, this. Um, and then have everything be uh, owned with using RCs because this this will basically do what we need, right? And it will mean that if we end up dropping the root of a tree, it will uh, it will just end up dropping all of the children that aren't used anymore. So any orphaned nodes can be dropped, um, and we can still we can build up a DAG out of this, right? Uh, directed acyclic acyclic graph because nodes will have multiple owners, um, but that's okay because that's how RC is supposed to work. Um, so probably the first thing we should do is to remove the arena um, because then the Rust compiler will start helping us. Um, so cargo build. No arena in arena. Now that is, yes, we need main because we defined the module. Okay, so that's no longer a thing. Uh, where is arena used? Right, we don't even need an arena. Uh, all right, so we probably should start um, the refactoring with the AST module, I think, um, because this is where I, I suspect the vast majority of the like the arena operations will happen. Um, so that there should be a definition down here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, all of this could do with being refactored. Here we go. Okay, so AST shouldn't have any lifetime, right? Because if Uh, 
Um, so the, the graph representation being a problem, I, it might, I'm not sure because the thing about, uh, like, so, so f first of all, what Sapling's doing, uh, with this kind of like keeping multiple versions of the same tree, um, or, or like multiple edits of a tree, right, is almost exactly the same problem that Git is trying to solve, right? Because Git, you store commits, which are like basically snapshots into a file tree, um, uh, because it's a tree of directories and files, and the files can be replaced, um, but the directories can't. I so I think. I, I don't know. I don't think a graph representation is any slower than a tree representation, right? Because um, the graph. Hold on. Can we? Can I get a, a scribbly thing? I think Miro. Miro board. Is this? Does this just work out of the box? Ooh. So. Is the optimization that ECS use applies to text editors. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, yes, probably. So the thing is, I suspect that the performance of... I, I, yeah, so I suspect that the performance of the node store won't be a problem for a while. Um, and the thing is, it's fairly... The code is fairly well refactored against, um, like, exactly how the nodes are stored in memory. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm really not sure of the best way of getting ECS to work with trees, um, because trees are just a bit nasty for um, data locality, really. Ah, can I just get a whiteboard? No, I don't want... I want somewhere where I can just draw. Online whiteboard. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely using RCs and pointers everywhere. Um, oh wait, this is my row. Okay, explain everything. Try it now. Uh, hold on. Why do you need to use my webcam? No, don't allow blank canvas. No thanks. I'll explore myself. Okay, okay, okay. Right. So yeah, pretty much. Hold on. Where I got it? Ah, excellent. Right. So yeah, the, the point is that we like um, the. Hold on, what 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 even was it that I was doing, that <laughs> I wanted? Um, yeah, okay, yeah. So pretty much, like, I'm I'm not sure how to use. Yeah, so it's to do with the performance of the graph representation, um, and I'm I'm not sure how you would store, <laughs> you would do it anyway, other way, right? Because um, I think. Cloning is going to be really fast, or at least, oops. Um, at least I think it's worth. Uh, what 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 even am I thinking about now? Um, yeah, so I think the using RCs as they are in the standard library is probably not the best solution, right? But it's better than the solution we have right now, um, and it will avoid passing lifetimes everywhere. Uh, which is will will always be an advantage, I think. Uh, rec talk. Uh, in fact, we don't even need this. So self, yeah, we can borrow self here, and then we don't even need an arena. We can just be say parse, right? Because if we're parsing text into an RC, into some data type with RC. Um, so if we're reference counting, then there's no problem of borrowing. Oh, okay. Uh -huh, so I'd expect mostly, I expect it to mostly in, impact traversals. Um, as you scan through things with children and only select component you're interested in. Yeah, I mean, so it, yeah, it, it really does depend on common usage. Um, I mean, probably the, hmm. yeah, so what I'd, what I quite like is that, um, like, yeah, when I say that, um, yeah, I, I think basically we will, 
I, I would like some way of doing like really big refactoring style stuff. Um, and I think like basically I want multiple cursors um, because multiple cursors are really great um, and they allow just like so much more composability right of commands. Um, so well, so okay. So here's here's the thing, right? So I think Arena is like definitely you could improve on performance by replacing RC with something better. Um, and at the moment, like we will only we only have one cursor accessible at any one time, and so yeah, like l edits are always local to the cursor right now. So RC is fine. Also, like there's no vertical scrolling implemented yet. So, like, the biggest file that Sapling can load and handle is, is fairly limited, right? So I don't think performance will ever be an issue until Sapling actually works, or at least, like, can be used for big files. Um, and then we can go down the whole, like, profiling, figuring out what is fast, like, or which bits are letting the side down in terms of speed. Um, but for the time being, I think the performance, like, the performance of Sapling as a whole is, like, perfectly adequate. Um, there are a whole lot of bigger issues, like um, having to render stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, probably, I, I'm not sure. I suspect that traversals might actually be the dominant uh, performance. Yeah, yeah, I, I think right now it's a premature op optimization. Um, but th that's not to say that it isn't worth talking about, right? Because... Um, Oh, okay, well, so, so I'm doing the refactoring, right? Like, the refactoring of changing how nodes are stored um, will be roughly as difficult as what I'm going to do now, or what I'm hoping to do the stream. Um, uh, yes, yeah, I, I remember this because, um, yeah, ECS is a pain, unless you've got um, unless the language that you're using has like some proper proper support for like structure of arrays versus array of structures, right? Um, and switching between the two. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't used ECS at all, really. Um, I remember it being a thing uh, in the Unity game engine uh, just before I kind of stopped using it because I switched to Linux and then Yeah, figured, figured that out. Um, but the thing is, sampling's not very big at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I would, if someone wants to refactor the code to make it into ECS, then, like, absolutely go ahead. Um, but I wonder whether or not we should get, like, parsing and stuff, parsing and rendering ha working properly, like, being able to preserve... Um, Preserving white space uh, is a pain um, to do. Uh, and that's basically just like get TreeSitter to work. Um, if, we can, if we can interface with TreeSitter properly, um, then TreeSitter will handle all of this for free. It's just that doing that is a pain. I tried it on one of the other streams. You can go back. I'm not sure where the thing might be up, up there. No, it will be that way. Um, there'll probably be a, a, a list of things. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, the, the thing about the whole, like, e ECS versus, um, like, any other way, um, like, as far as I'm concerned, like, using RCs and storing things actually as a tree, um, is, like, it, it's very, kind of intuitive, like, it's the way, um, like, the, the trees are trees, and there's no sense duplicating data when you don't have to. So you use RCs to make sure that you own multiple copies of the same data. Um, and I think it's a nice, like it will make the rest of the code easy to build um, because this is quite intuitive, I think. Um, if later down the line it becomes too slow, um, then sure, <laughs> like re refactoring into ECS is probably the better option. Um, Right, display tokens. Yeah, we want to borrow self. Um, Vec. I'm centering a self. What? Uh, I 
I think this, um, ha, this refactoring is going to be more difficult than I thought. Okay, so I think that will fix it for now, or at least it will, <laughs> will stop the compiler from complaining. Right, we don't need the annotation here because we can borrow, if we have RCs working, if all of the nodes have multiple ownership, then um, we can get RC working, that's fine. So children, children needs to return RC here um, because the, the children, the child slice will be a slice of RC, uh, RCs, right? Because we'll essentially have um, uh, hello, no, I just want to draw. Okay, yes, yeah, so we'll have like root node um, and then it will contain some number of children, right? So it will be a pointer into a vec, um, which will be like, let's say this is an array, right? So this is an array of stuffs. Um, and then these will be RC, right? Because we could have two different arrays here with their own children, child slices, and we want to be able to duplicate. Um, so like we, we need two owners of say, I don't know, let's say there's true or something in the array. Um, and then the other values, we might need two falses or whatever, or maybe it's another array even. Um, so we can do stuff like this. Um, and so the, the slice will be a slice of RCs because um, the values in this slice, th these are not pointers, they're RCs. Um, so this needs to return RC. Oh wait, we haven't done that. Let's uh, use std RC RC. I'm surprised Rust Analyzer doesn't suggest using RC um, because it, it's really trigger happy about like other things from the standard library, um, which is odd. Where did we get to? Oh, we got to here. Okay, children mute. Right, well, this is the same. We want to return RC. Uh, replaces the index. New node. We can pass in the new node by value because that will... Oh, wait, hold on. By the way, since you... Mutation. Hold on, wait. Is, is making RC mutable a thing? What? What? I did not know this. This is literally a game changer for my other project. This is insane. Oh, you have no idea how much. Oh, thanks, Plectra. I'm so glad you've come to the stream. This is great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, because one of the other projects, I was like, oh, am I going to have to like make a, a library that's like, when I make a mutable value, I have to clone the data or something. Um, but yeah, oh, that's really cool. That, in fact, oh, in fact, that makes life really easy. That, oh, this is fantastic. Okay. Uh, insert child. Uh, one. So the, the, yeah, I, I, I had seen it. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe this is just stream delay. I'm not sure what the, the, t the two little things. Oh, is it a... Maybe it's a happy face. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll wait for stream delay to catch up whilst I have a drink. Ah, uh, okay. Because I, I wasn't sure, like, sometimes if if I think someone, it, like, if I'm, if I'm texting someone um, and, like, I, I, and they miss a message, then I'll usually, like, put a load of ups to say, Oh yeah, um, read the message I sent you. Uh, insert child, right? So we don't even need an arena anymore. Um, right. Right, tree view. Okay, we, we can just borrow self. So that'll be borrowed out of the arena. Tree view. Yep, we borrow self. Uh, because th these are literally just uh, different ways of rendering. Oh, we've got no... Ah, so there's only one uh, complaint now. Node is AST. In fact, uh, doing this recursively, we don't even need this. 
uh, oh, I, I want to refactor all of this writing to the screen. Um, oh wait, re write tree view recursive. Uh, no, maybe this isn't the thing I want to refactor. Anyway, uh, this is kind of off topic. Uh, let's get rid of that. Uh, ha! Right, no more, no more complaints from this file. Let's cargo build. Oh, 24 errors. That's nice. I, I've had a new record recently uh, with Sapling of most compiler errors emitted. Um, and it was like 300 and something uh, compiler errors. And they, they were errors, not warnings. Um, it was probably insane. It was um, a whole shed load of unit tests just completely broke. Uh, it was it, it was it was not a good day. <laughs> that was that was like a whole evening of refactoring to fix that. Uh, right, so main is the last thing we need to refactor. Um, I think, yeah, I, so I think we need to, now that we've changed the trait for how ASTs are implemented, um, because because pretty much you want, uh, the, my idea with the whole, like, uh, having sapling support different languages was that you would have uh, some trait for like, oh yeah, what is it to be a syntax tree or a specification for a syntax tree? And then every language would implement that. Um, except that that's not, that's less than ideal because it means that new languages have to be compiled into the compiler, uh, sorry, into the code, right? Um, which is not super useful uh, <laughs> because like, can you like imagine you open like Tommel or something and it's like, oh, Oh, wait, how many zeros is that? Okay, 10,000. <laughs> wow. Um, that, that, that is impressive. I, I've, I've got to admit. Ha, ha, hands up. Like, uh, what, what's that? Yeah, I, I tip my hat. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't envy the person who had to fix that, all of those. I, I probably you. <laughs> uh, right, so we need to... We, we changed the, the trait in... Uh, what is it? X or T. So we changed the trait for syntax trees. Um, so the AST module here, we got mod, and then the only implementation so far is JSON. Um, so th I think the first thing we should do is to change JSON. In fact, we can, if we open main.rs, we can force a lot of this code to stop. Um, If we if we just comment out everything that's complaining, um, and just add fun main, then we should only get compiler errors from JSON, right? Core path. Oh right, yeah, because path relies on uh, the AST module, right? That's. <laughs> oh, oh right, so the compiler literally said 10,000 plus. Oh, I love that. Um, I also love how someone put the limit for that at a power of 10, right? So like, th they were like, oh, well, we shouldn't let anyone print a number that's bigger than around 10,000, right? So they were like, okay, we're going to have the, the 10,000 plus, right? Except that by adding plus onto the end, you've made it one digit bigger, right? So it ought to cap out at, uh, like, how many zeros is that? Oh yeah, there's four. So it should cap out at like 9,999 plus. Uh, and then you'd be like, yes, you cap it at this many. Um, but yeah, that's some fun with how that works. Like realistically, uh, like how, how even, um, how did you even get that many errors? Um, anyway, let's, let's continue refactoring. Right, arena will complain because it doesn't exist. So now add value to arena. Um, so converts, oh yeah, because we're using SERDI, SERDI JSON as a JSON parser right now. So we got the arena, which we're allocating to, right? So this, the arena just doesn't need to exist. Um, so, right, so this is RC new. And, oh, we, we can't do that. Use std 
I'll say awesome. Uh, right, and in here, pretty much every um, every time we mention the arena, we should be. Oh, I've deleted a bracket. I shouldn't have done. Um, we should be referencing RC. I believe the point wasn't number, just one. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, it just like stops printing them. I mean, like in all honesty, like more than a, th uh, like, I don't know, more than about 20 error messages. Like you may as well stop printing them because like no one, no one in their right mind is going to see that many error messages come out of a compiler and then sit through and read the error messages, right? Like you're going to start fixing them uh, one by one. Um, okay, so we need to, uh, we need to grab, basically this is find a replace because we need to, um, we need to do arena.alloc um, and this should be replaced with rc new on all nines because uh, instead of allocating things into an arena we're just building up a tree with rcs so it's rc json hello oh yeah missing lifetime that's okay uh, and then we oops i recently discovered that um Oh, yeah. I, I, I've yet to experience a company code base, but it must be insane. Um, because also companies have a different, um, like they have a different set of priorities to open source. Um, because open source, you can, like, you don't have to ship usually. Um, so th th there are very few deadlines in open source. So you're like, okay, well, it's worth the upfront effort of making a code base really well um whereas in a company like oh you, you've got to keep going and adding code so you end up really really big oh. right big drinks okay right let's let's continue what's the next thing that this is complaining about right json just doesn't need a lifetime anymore and instead of these we're going to use RC. RC JSON. Um, right. Oh, I need to keep using T, like the T key in Vim. I didn't know about this, that, that T, T was a thing um, in Vim for ages. Um, and then my friend was just like, yo, you know, uh, oh, in fact, I was trying to decide some mapping for sapling and I was like, oh, um, what does T do in Vim? Um, and it was like, oh, it's like F, but it stops one before it would, the thing you were searching for, right? Um, which is super helpful. Oh, right, yes. Porting from 32, porting from different bit widths. I mean, not from personal experience. Like, I, I, I don't know from personal experience how bad that is. Um, oh, yo. Hey, welcome. You arrived just in the middle of a, a, a conversation about, um, <laughs> like, it, it, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, who's met the most compiler messages, yeah, the compi most compiler warnings um, or errors, whatever, pretty much the same things. Um, okay, pars to arena. Well, this is this is just pars now. Um, hold on, how about a tapi I, I can't pronounce that. Sorry if I've just butchered your name. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've said your name before on stream, but maybe not. Maybe I'm, my memory is awful. It, it, it is quite awful, but, um, okay, so, okay, add value to arena. Um, right, well, this is not adding to an arena anymore. This is alloc, um, or make rc. In fact, hang on, hang on, there's no, um, this is convert, right? 
because there's no point returning an RC at this point. Um, Oh, nice. So, uh, looking at tree city documentation, it doesn't look like it'd be useful directly. Um, well, no. So what I my, what my plan was, right? Uh, so yes, it doesn't require any APIs to query the grammar, which is something that we're going to have to do, um, because the thing is that tree sitter, um, like tree sitter, has a different idea. Uh, like like tree sitter is fundamentally constructed fundamentally differently to how yes so th this is what um th this was my plan you've you've hit the nail on the head there um which is that uh tree sitter is not really designed for this use case right because we the, the use case of sapling is that the tree the ast is the ground truth right you edit the ast and then when you need text you convert to text when necessary um, whereas the, the, the kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know, the structure of tree sitter is more, oh, you have some text, right? And the user is editing the text and then you have to keep the syntax tree up to date with the text, um, which is not really what we want. That being said, tree sitters parsing is excellent. Um, and they have a really good supply of grammars that are kept up to date, um, so what I ideally like, like my holy grail would be, we have our own parser somehow, whether or not it's like statically compiled um, C files that do the parsing um, and deparsing, right? Like you need, you need to know the grammar because otherwise you won't be able to unparse the, the syntax tree that you've got or unparse, I mean like uh, print it to the screen, right? Requires combining a syntax tree and a grammar plus probably some information about white space um, back into a text to go on the screen. Or like locations on the screen where things should be printed, which is what it does currently. It doesn't even go to text um, because text doesn't have any like syntax highlighting information. Um, whereas we want that. So oh, this is gonna be a bit painful doing this. So, So we're basically like, there's no point creating new RCs in every match arm. At the very least, we should do it at the end. Um, yeah, I, so I'm not sure, like, Kako, like Kakoin is basically, like, I, I really like Kakoin as an editor. Um, it's just that I, I like I've invested so much time in configuring NeoVim, uh, and like I, I I don't want to switch to Kakuin, but a lot of like Sapling's ideas are inspired by Kakuin, um, because it's just a like it's a fresh take on VI. Oh oh, that's what you mean by embedded language. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, I think there should be a way of defining that um, because, uh, oh yeah. So what if, um, what if instead of having languages, right? Oh, I can, okay, right. Um, how do I just clear everything? Is this, huh, what, um, is this rubber? Oh, it is except uh, what <laughs> why is this so hard how can i not like what is this hello you can't add tool text shapes eraser ah yes i just need bigger eraser Right, here we go. Um, so here's my thought, right? So um, I don't think there's anything standard. 
um, just generally. Um, but like, but it is, it, it's weird that there's no standard in a way, right? Because um, this happens an awful lot. Um, Cause like take uh, JSON, no, JavaScript frameworks, right? Like stuff like Vue. Um, uh, in fact, I have a, a Vue code base that I can just open. Um, CD ring room. Uh, what is it? It's app temp no app static static ring room. Here we go. Um, so basically, like this is a view application, right? So we have um, we we have templates. Basically, is the upshot. Um, so what we'd really like is to say, oh yeah, anything with this pattern, right? So instead of what we'd want to say is instead of treating this string literal here as a string we want to embed HTML inside it, or XML, right? Because HTML doesn't really need to be its own language um, as far as parsing is concerned. Um, and that would be really helpful. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not it's worth doing, like having the parser be statically built into Sapling and having it consume grammars at runtime. Um, so kind of like having the parser and unparser be um, kind of like either a virtual machine or a runtime, if you like, for grammars. Uh, yes, that would be cool. Um, well, so ideally you'd want some kind of, uh, you'd want something more complicated than just, um, oh, whenever you see this, backtick or whatever like backtick delimited strings are always html right because they're not like just like no kidding they're just not um you, you can use backticks for whatever the heck you want but if you could have some kind of rule that's like um you, you had some grammar that was like oh hey we've got javascript except whenever there's a field like whenever you see this pattern where you're like template colon uh, you've got a field of an object and it's called template and we've used this string literal. Like w what we want to say is like, whenever you see this, then the contents of this string has to be like, you need to reinterpret this as XML and then you need to restart um, parsing XML as we go. Right. And what I wondered is um, if we had uh, the parser it could just be uh, right. Oh, you're in the wrong code base. Um, but let's just open Vim with a blank file to, for starters. So what I thought was that um, what would be really nice is, uh, oh, I didn't mean to do this. Let's open Ring Room again. Um, what would be really nice is if you could open, um, if you could whilst like navigating the syntax tree, um, yeah, Rust macros are in fact a pain. Uh, there's such a nightmare for parsing. Um, yeah, this this has been done, um, and but the thing is, my priority right now, really, with Sapling, is to get it running, right? So get it to a point where it could work, um, because it's all a bit of an experiment, really. Like, I I don't really know if a text editor like this would even be usable, right? Because no. If it were usable in production, it would be the first uh, syntax tree editor in production, pretty much, right? Um, and so it would be it would be a first. So there's there's not a lot of perceived like, uh, well, like collective wisdom that we can pull from about like what works and what doesn't. Um, so it's all a bit of a voyage of discovery, as far as that's concerned. Um, but anyway, so what I was thinking, right, was that. Uh, imagine you were editing this JavaScript file in Sapling. But yes, yeah, it's definitely something that we should make sure that we don't accidentally shoot ourselves in the foot later, right? Um, like, I don't know. I I'm not sure if there are any good examples of people making poor di design decisions. I I I've certainly done it and paid for it in refactoring time later. Um, but so uh, imagine that we would like, editing this right and obviously the tree is something along the lines of hey we, we have this um 
this thing and then we'd move down the syntax tree somehow. And then let's say we reached this, uh, like, uh, this statement here and we've got the cursor to here. Um, what I'd really like to be able to do um, is rather than forcing the user to always use, like always only edit the syntax tree, um, we have the text representation that we can go to. Um, and it would be really nice if we had some kind of like shortcut that was like T. Um, so we've got this far, um, we got to like selecting this and then I, I'd quite like to go into like text selection mode um, and then it would create like a kind of text box around here. Um, and then we could just edit the text directly. Um, so we could like add plus something on the end and then add some things. Um, and then when we exit out of text mode, it would reparse just that section of the document and then replace that's that in the syntax tree. Like it would replace this statement in the syntax tree with whatever the parsed version was. Um, and if we have decent error correction um, in the syntax tree, in the, if the parser has really good error detection and like error localization. So if I like deleted a bracket here um, or even where it's deleting, deleted a closed bracket, um, if it realized that actually we probably didn't want to put all of this into a, a thing, um, then it would be really cool because you could be like, um, if I was doing some really fiddly editing um, of a, um, like some statement or other, like if I want to add one to something, then it's far easier to go into text mode and insert plus one and have the thing reparsed than it is to like have to figure out how to add one, like add the bits to the syntax tree. Um, but that basically means that your parser is going to look something along the lines of, um, if we just, can I just add and have a new thing? Um, basically, it will just look like a load of um, things that's like parse statement, right? Um, and it's some, uh, I don't know whether it's a string or it, it, it's, we should probably, can we say syntax rust? No, okay, fine. I don't know how to do that. But we've got like, we've got to have a load of parsing things that will be like parse statement, um, and then parse statement will call parse expression or, or whatever. Um, and these this code like could be just generated by, from a grammar, right? So we could have CFG um, or a context-free grammar. And this would be something like statement goes to, I don't know what a statement goes to. It may be, it's like um, variable, uh, equals expression, um, or it's, what else could we have as a statement? It's like if um, expression, then statement, or block in here, right? Um, or whatever, or it's for, or I, I don't know, like while expression, uh, block. And then we have this load of things, um, and the, the whole like point of a parser generator is that it like reads a file like this. Yeah, the, the parser will need to be incredibly flexible. Um, and I was wondering whether it would might just be simpler um, to have some kind of dynamic system where it's like you feed it, if not the text representation of a grammar, you like feed it some kind of Rust, Rust data type that represents the grammar. Um, right, so this is like, a Rust data type that represents any grammar, not like the, the whole trait system we have currently. Um, and then you would have some parser and you'd be like, hey, can I parse a statement? Like, I have some text and I know it's a statement. Could you please parse it? Right, and the parser would be forced to output an answer um, because you should have, like anyway, I think we should have some kind of error, like error node in the tree where it's like, oh, uh, we had this string and it doesn't make sense. Um, for a minimal viable product, would it be best to target a specific language? I think most of the features I'd like to see in Sapling would also require a degree of semantic analysis. Yes, so I, I'm not really sure of the best way of doing... Um, <laughs> yeah, I exactly. Like, we don't, want to, we don't want to implement all of these before we have a text editor. Um, but so at the moment, Sapling targets JSON. Um, 
And the thing it's thing is, I'm kind of, I'm loath. I, I, I'm loath to make Sapling into a single text edit, single language text editor, at any point. Um, and because so I think yes, so it it will definitely make it easier to think about. But I think refactoring in a second language into a one language text ed, uh, syntax tree editor or structured text editor, that's what they're called. Um, refactoring the second language in will be really hard. Um, but once we have two languages, then adding a third will be easy, right? Because we've got some level of genericness. Um, so I think, yes, the MVP should not try and target every language. Um, in fact, I think XML and JSON are probably the two languages. If I could choose two to start, that would be like, hey, here is what's the two easiest languages we could parse? Um, because to be honest, like XML and JSON, okay, JSON's really a really nice, simple language, but XML has its share of quirks, right? Like, um, it, it's, it's a little bit gnarly and it's very different to JSON, um, is the like two things. Um, so I, I, what I'd really like, to be honest, uh, with Sapling is that if you were to add a language, right? So let's say I, uh, uh, let's just write this to him. Um, let's say I'm... Uh, wait, so yeah, three to four. Hmm. Yeah, so the issue is that for every one of these languages that we add to Sapling, in the, like, minimum viable product, right, I don't think the MVP for Sapling would contain a full-on parser, right? Like, the kind of tree sitter style. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's an interesting suggestion. I've never used Lua. Um, it's one of the languages I want to use. Um, but uh, Scheme as well as Scheme or Lisp is probably too simple as well um, in terms of it's a very... Like, the, the, the number of different... Like, I guess language complexity is the number of different statements you have in the context-free grammar describing it, right? Um, because JSON has very, very few, um, because it, it's really not very complicated, right? It, okay, it's got lots of data types. You've got arrays and stuff, right? But array contains JSON objects, right? And then... Um, oh, C, C is a good point. Um, Although, so, so, right, so here's the thing, like, here's what I think is more important to me than complexity in choosing a minimum viable product. It's, yeah, um, no, C is a very good shout, actually. Um, and, oh, yeah, to answer the other question, I have no idea why people would still choose XML over JSON. Um, all other things being equal. Uh, well, okay, I guess it depends what you're using XML and JSON for, right? Um, because Wayfire took XML over JSON. I, yeah, I don't know. Like, why why you would use XML to transfer data between two programs, I've no idea. Like, JSON is really good for that. Um, but, like, obviously, HTML would work nowhere near as well if it used JSON as its backing, right? Um, Uh, usage feature app a lot. That's not edit a lot. Yeah, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking Rust and, um, uh, I, I'm thinking we implement Rust and JSON. Um, yes, yeah, that, that's the point. XML is definitely better for JSON, uh, for documents. Sorry. Um, but yeah, the thing is, that in order to implement a language in Sapling without tree sitter or something like that providing the parsing, um, we need to implement the parser ourselves, basically, or we need to use another parser. Um, or, or, yeah, so we need to write, either write a wrapper around someone else's parser, or we need to full on write the parser generator ourselves. Um, Yeah, but so the thing is that Rust syntax is really complicated, but people have already written Rust parsers for it, 
like parsers for it in Rust. Um, I definitely think C, um, like maybe the progression of languages we'd want when we're testing out the parser generator um, is perhaps like, I don't know, JSON XML C. Yeah, so that, that's the thing, sin is a thing. Um, and sin is basically a token tree parser. Um, but the thing is, I, I, yeah, so I'm not even, I'm, I'm wondering if some kind of dynamic parser needs to be involved in, like, I, I think we need to, sapling needs to get out of the language specific parsing at some point, right? Like, it's never going to fulfill, it's never going to be able to edit lots of different languages easily unless there's a really easy way to add languages, right? And that's not pulling in a whole new tool chain in a different language. Um, yeah, Rust syntax also is not context free, um, which is a bit of a kicker if you're using a, um, if you're using a parser generator that only accepts context free languages. Um, which is something that we're going to have to get rid of anyway, um, because stuff like Haskell has one of the worst grammars on the planet um, in terms of how flexible it is. Uh, so does Scala. Scala is awful, like really terrifying to parse. Um, like basically, the more the more restrictive the language is, in some ways, the better, um, because it's much more difficult. If the language lets you do loads of different things, then and you make a mistake, then the compiler doesn't really know what you intended, right? Because there isn't anything obvious, right? Like, um, uh, yeah, so, so the more the more restrictive the grammar is, I think the better for a language. But that's like by the by, we're not trying to build a language here, we're trying to build an editor. Um, but the thing is, I think the concept of having to deal with uh, white space and like formatting, right? We need to, we need to store the formatting. I don't think there's an, a way around it. I've like I've pushed against it for a very long time. Um, I've not wanted to have to deal with formatting. Like it would be so much better if you could just parse the entire document into a syntax tree, delete all of the formatting information, right? And then when the user wants to save to a file, you just save you render the syntax tree in however you feel. Um, and that would be, that would be so great, uh, but unfortunately, like, colon rust. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. Um, I, I, I just like using colons for types. I, I think it's a better system than just putting your type arguments next to, um, just using spaces. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's an aside. Um, I think... Like, whatever the parsing thing that we're going to have to do, it has to preserve, like, whatever our way of storing syntax trees is, um, it's got to preserve the white space in the tree, right? So it's got to save somehow into our syntax tree model the white space that, like, it's basically got to store all the tokens, I think. Um, and that's going to be a nasty refactor if we're going from... Um, well, like, I, I think it has to be in the minimum viable product is that if you open a text file, if, if you open a file with this, like with sapling, right, and save it again, it can't reformat everything. Um, like it could, but the thing is comments don't really fit into a standard grammar, right, because they can go anywhere. They're just a bit of a nightmare. Um, and you just can't remove comments from source code because that will be awful. Um, that will just like, <laughs> that will never work. Um, like, so we've got to handle comments somehow. Uh, yes, well, so the user doesn't ever interact with white space in sapling, like they shouldn't. Um, but the thing is you still have to deal with it, right? Because imagine, um, uh, like, yeah, let's, let's go back to Sapling's code base. Um, cause let's say I open some Rust code, right? And, um, it is, let's say, let's say by some magic, we manage to get a way of parsing code that handles comments, but removes white space, right? 
um, then one, like, how do you deal with single line comments? Um, because you need to know where they finish. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, one, you've got to deal with single line comments, which will be a bit of a pain. Um, but two, like, there are some cases where you need white space in order to change the meaning of a code, of code, right? Um, I mean, this code is pretty crammed, but imagine I put a break here, right? I, I had a gap. Um, and note that, like, by doing this, I haven't changed, I, I haven't changed how the code would parse, right? The syntax tree is the same. All I've done is added another new line to this bit of white space. Um, and the thing is, this has, this is semantically different, like, not from the language's perspective, but from the, but from the user's perspective, this is a very different thing, right? Um, like, having this code on its own, um, like the addition of the blank line changed the meaning. Like it changed how the code reads. Um, so I wouldn't want an editor that I open it and it deletes all of my blank lines, right? So basically you're at the point now where you're like, hey, I want to get rid of white space, but I want to be able to tell two lines apart, two new lines apart from one new line, right? And you're like, uh, and I was thinking about this and I was like, actually, hold on you are literally worrying about white space now. Um, I think the only sane way that you can do that and handle comments as well, because you could handle comments as like glorified white space as far as the, um, uh, as far as the syntax tree is concerned. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think we're going to have to handle white space at some point. Um, and you could do, because we're parsing at the same time, where you could do some really nice things, like you could, um, instead of, let's say, like, the white space in between this bracket and the start of this, um, instead of saving this as, like, new line and then however many spaces this is, um, you could just save it in terms of indentation, right? So it's like, hey, this is a new line, um, and then it's one indentation level deeper, or it's like new line and then four characters more indentation. Um, and at the end of here, this will be like new line and four levels less indentation, right? And then, uh, and then you have the property that if I were to copy this code into somewhere else, like I were to move it here, then the editor would just go like, hey, I've copied this stuff and it has no, um, it has no indentation all on its own. It's just some stuff. And this is four indentation levels or like four spaces further to the right than its parent. Um, so I could copy this and paste it here. And because like the white space is parsed relative to the stuff around it, um, it would just, instead of doing what Vim would do, which is blindly copy the new lines and put the code here. Um, and, and this is what every text editor would do. Every text editor, not syntax tree editor, right? Um, instead, it would do the right number of things and put it here. Um, because it would know that these quotes, like, at worst case, it would put the quotes here um, and then do that. Yeah, well, so... Uh, yeah, okay, so in terms of, storing in terms of indentation is, yeah. Well, so in my opinion, like, okay, so the whole thing about in, inconsistently indented documents, right, is a problem, right? Like, I, I don't deny that it's a problem, but I think the whole point of, like, sapling in the first place um, is that we're kind of, uh, we're kind of trading off generality for, um, Yes, yeah, so Plectra, that's right. Um, the uh, formatting component um, is just semantically relevant white space. That's how comments are defined in uh, tree sitter as well, in tree sitter grammars. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think I would not, I would be happy, I think, at least naively to implement like indentation, like relative indentation storing white space 
on the basis that Sapling is a code editor. Like, it really won't work very well if you just give it a text file, right? Because text edit, text files don't have a syntax tree, right? There's nothing to really edit. Um, so Sapling will perform worse. What well, Python enforcing consistency? Well, yeah, so here's the thing. I, JSON is an example where, yes, indentation doesn't really matter. Um, but also, like, it, it, it's not like you're breaking anything, right? Like, so I, I, I'm not sure what the alternative is, right? Because if you think about it, we have two ways of storing white space, right? We either store it as literal strings. Um, Uh, well, yeah, so so that's that that's correct, right? That an opinionated editor could enforce formatting, and the thing about that is that that's basically what auto formatters are for, in my opinion. Like, I think an opinionated editor should defer to an auto formatter, right? Because that's um, I don't know, maybe that's just a, like a Unix view of that, which, which is that you should have auto formatters, and an auto formatter should be good for the language you're auto formatting. Right. And then uh, I, I don't know, like, I don't think you should build that into the text editor. Um, I think Sapling definitely needs a way of handling auto formatters like Rust Fumt or whatever else. Um, but I don't think. Uh... OK, so, yeah, OK, that no, that's a good question. So I'm not saying that Sapling is a textless editor. Um, the problem is that. Sapling, uh, one of the go design goals of Sapling, which, you know, uh, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, good, good on the formatter. So, um, the thing, one of the design goals of Sapling, right, is that it needs to work, right, so the thing is, if auto formatters were perfectly deterministic, right, like, uh, you could just parse the text and join it. Um, well, yeah, so the thing is that what I want, um, like one of the things that Sapling needs to be able to do in order to be accepted into the current ecosystem is that it needs to fit properly into the existing ecosystem, right? You can't be like going to someone's code base and being like, hey, I need to reformat all of your code because I'm using a weird text editor that like will save all of your code differently, right? The current f ecosystem is that you store files to disk as text, right? And I'm not, I'm not attempting to change that, right? Like, I, I wish it weren't that way. Like, I'm not saying it's the only way of storing it and I'm definitely not saying it's the best, but, I am also not saying that it should be the job right now to make a new text editor and then enforce that everyone stores things as syntax trees, right? That's just not going to happen. You'll just, you're just consigning yourself to, like, I, by doing so, I would consign Sapling to always being obscure, right? Because it would never work in anyone else's pipeline. So basically, like, the the high level design constraint is that, if I were to use Sapling on a project, no one else should be able to know that I'm doing it, right? Yes, so, th but the thing is that mixing spaces and tabs, right, like, um, yeah, I don't like, on one level, I don't like auto formatters, right? Like, I don't, I don't particularly like how Rust formed, formats Rust code. But the thing that is very powerful is that it just stops people bike shedding about how code is formatted, right? Like, it doesn't really matter that much how code is formatted. And I'd much rather always run Rust formed on incoming pull requests and make sure that everyone uses the same code style, even if it's not the one I would use. Um, 
I, I'd much rather have that happen than everyone do their own formatting things and then end up flame warring, like having flame wars with people in pull request comments, right? Like that's just not, that's not useful. Like we're, we're just wasting our time talking about formatting. Um, and of course the ideal scenario is that we get rid of formatting altogether. Um, but that would be pushing too hard against the current ecosystem. I think if we do want that to be the future, then the best thing we can do at the moment is to build something like Sapling that keeps using text, but uses syntax trees as like the user facing representation. Oh yeah, like I, I'm not saying that RustFumt always does a good job. A RustFumt is horrible in some respects. Like I wish, um, like, uh, uh, for example, like the, here we got we got a good example, right? We got this stuff. Like, why? Um, yeah, I mean, same. But the thing is, um, like, Rust Fump's existence is like more than outweighs the fact that I disagree with it. If that makes sense, right? Like, like obviously, I have my opinions about how code should be formatted. But the thing is, I care more about consistency than I do about everything being my way, right? Because in... Well, because the thing is, uh, no, no, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying, right? Which is that um, we're, we're trying to Right, we, so we're trying to store a new line plus so many spaces, right? Or, like, let's just take this bit of new line, right? We're trying to store this text, right? Um, but the thing is, storing it relative to the last new line we saw, um, I think is perfectly reasonable, right? Because we'll, we won't ever... Um, hold on, what am I trying to say? Oh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, okay, so... Here's the thing, right? So we've got, um, so it would have made more sense to store any kind of white space. Yeah, so I, I think more to the point, it doesn't really matter how we represent white space. That's my, um, that's like the upshot, I think. Um, because if you think about it, we've got like, we've got several representations, right? We've got text files. Um, oh, we've got, to, we, I can just write text and then, um, so we got a text file, um, oh, okay, so, so what we could do, right, is instead of storing five more spaces, right, we could store, um, like some kind of diff where it's like, oh, we have, the last indentation plus four spaces. And then if someone uses a tab, then it's like, hey, it's the last indentation we saw plus a tab, right? Um, but anyway, let me let me keep uh, explaining this. So I, I, I think this is relevant, right? Because we, we basically have a whole load of different representations, right? We've got the AST, right? Or like it might be an annotated AST, right? So it's annotated AST. But fundamentally, it's still a syntax tree. Um, can I can I move this somewhere? No. Oh God, what's going on? Okay. Um, so we've got text files, right? Which is our output format ultimately. And then we've got um, like we've got display, right? Which is what we're going to display to the user. Um, and these two, like naively, you could say. Hey, yeah, obviously, like display, you display it in the same way that you would render to a text file. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, right? Um, and the important thing is that we end up with like a, a, con a flow state. Well, like we, we could draw a graph of like what conversions we're going to have to do, right? So we're going to have to take a text file and build an annotated syntax tree out of it. Right? That, that's perfectly reasonable, I think, um, because that's how we're going to open a file. Right. And then if we want to save a file, we have to always convert an annotated syntax tree back to a text, right? Hmm? 
Yes, but we, so yes, we lose that information. But the thing is, we can reconstruct that information. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So pretty much my point is that um, we have some mode that we want to display, right? So we have these three different representations. And importantly, the only thing we don't have to implement out of this graph, right? We never have to go directly between these two, right? That doesn't need to happen because we'll only ever convert between the, the internal representation and a text file and then we'll convert it into a display form for the user, right? Um, so the thing is, this doesn't even, like, the, the, it doesn't really matter how we handle the internal representation, right? Um, this is, like, the internal syntax tree is actually kind of invisible to the user, right? Because they see the display and they see text files and they don't actually directly see this, right? Like, obviously they edit it and... Intermediate lines. Oh, uh, yeah, so we got to deal with rogue stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so the display and text form being the same thing. That was how I thought about it originally. And I was like, actually, this doesn't make any sense, right? Because, or at least it makes less sense than I thought it did. Um, because, because the thing is, it, like the things we care about, like we, we don't really have any restrictions on what text files have to do, right? They're just text. Um, the only restriction is that this circle, the, the only restriction I think is that performing this circle, right? Parsing and then saving. What are the significant differences? It is that we need to display two extra things on the display view, right? We need to, um, so, oh, okay, so there are actually three differences, right? Which is that one, when we're displaying to the user, we don't need to deal with the entire syntax tree, right? We only need to display a section of it on the screen at any one time. Um, and the second one is we want syntax highlighting um, because the thing is we've already done, like we've already done the hard work to get syntax highlighting working. Um, because we already have the syntax tree and therefore we can just like, if we just annotate the tokens in the syntax tree with what, like what color they have to be rendered or what category they are, like whether or not they're a literal or a, um, a common or some punctuation, whatever, right? Um, and the third one is that we need to display the cursor location. Um, and those are two things that we need for the display that we don't need for, um, the or like for saving to a text file um, obviously we could have one pipeline to do it um, but the thing is so currently right what we've got at the moment is that we've got a display token like the way we, it works currently is a bit janky um, so we've got display token which has like you know it, it has syntax categories which are strings because this needs to be runtime extensible. Um, and then we have a display token, right? And this is, um, this is what all of the, um, like this is what the unparsing spits out. Instead of spitting out text, it spits out a stream of display tokens, right? And these are like, hey, that it's some text with a syntax category or it's white space, um, in this case, you know, this should be a string, right? Because white space is strings. Um, but at the moment, it's just like how many spaces of white space have we got? Um, and then we've got new line indent dden, which is obviously like, this is woefully simplistic, right? This would never work for anything in practice, but it works quite nicely for the whole situation of like, we want to just display stuff to the user, right? And at the moment, we're not even storing white space. So this is all being generated. Um, and it doesn't really matter about that kind of thing. Um, and the thing is, this can be quite easily, we can just convert a stream of display tokens to text and we can display it to the user easily um, and put the colors in because we know the syntax categories. Um, and then we have recursive token, which needs refactoring. Um, and rectoc is like, it's a token, except that we also store when 
when we switch between two nodes. So when we, like, when we're parsing everything out into a flat token stream, um, instead of actually doing that, you parse the root node, and then it's like, oh no, you you, you parse all of the things, and it's like, I don't know. Let's let's boot up something again. Where's cargo run? Um, hello. Oh, of course it doesn't work. Let's git stash because we made a load of changes and now it doesn't compile. Um, so this should recompile and run. Right. So basically, like, imagine we're displaying this JSON to the user. Um, and importantly, like, at the moment, we're not storing any kind of white space, right? So this is literally just the representation. It's like, it's an array that contains true, false, and an object with this contents. Um, and so we turn this into a stream. We need to turn this into a stream of tokens, ideally, right? Because it's like, hey, we've got this bracket, then true, then comma, then false, then comma, then open bracket. Um, but we also need to know where the cursor is, right? We need to know which of these tokens are, the, which of them is the user, is the user's cursor over. Um, because we, we need to move the cursor around and have something change. Um, and ideally, it would also show us what's the children. So it would highlight this a bit as well. Um, but that doesn't happen yet. And so basically we need we need to know what node all of these pieces belong to. Um, and in fact, there is a debug view somewhere that displays all of the things. Um, where is it? I think, is it in no config? Ah, debug highlight, here we go. So I believe if we set this to true and then recompile, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So now it displays every um, every set of tokens. It displays it according to uh, I think technically it's according to the hash of the memory address of the node. Um, so like you know, it's basically nodes that, um, but uh, yeah, basically tokens that are part of the same node will be coloured the same colour. Um, so we can see, for example, that these two um, square br uh, curly braces here are both part of the object um, that they're in. Um, and this way we can figure out where the user's cursor is. Um, and so basically, instead of like flattening out the whole token stream to start with, um, we instead flatten out the root token stream and then we store like tokens that are actually like, hey, here's the child, right? So we're like, we'd flatten it into just um, angle bracket, like open bracket, and then pointer to the child, the, like this is some child down here. Then we have a comma, then we have some child, then we have some comma, then we have another child, then we have a closing bracket, right? And then when we're displaying it from the, to the user, we can then recursively go down and go, oh yeah, well, okay, let's add the, bracket to the view and then oh we've got it what what's next well we've got some child we don't know what that is let's start expanding the child and then we expand the child into it oh it's only the token true and then we put the comma in and so on um so to go back to like this model in fact this is not quite correct um in as much as we actually have a kind of third representation which is um uh, text. So the tokens. Uh, what was it called? I think it was like display token was the name of the type. Um, and so we actually have this and we, so we currently have this weird loop where we're like, we parse directly from text files into the AST and then we can convert the AST into display token, and then we can display display tokens, and we can convert them to text, um, which is a bit of an interesting way round, I think. Um, ideally, we'd store. Hold on, could we not just store display tokens um, in some kind of format? Because um, I, I think we could. Because all we need um, for like. Can I not scroll? Oh, this is um, uh, this is an advantage of Miro over this. Um, but basically, imagine we have like hello. 
yeah, so imagine we have like uh, th this. So we have some JSON and it's like uh, an array, an array. And then this is randomly on a new line. And we have true and then a closing bracket, right? So we have some weirdly formatted JSON. Um, what I was wondering is could we not store this as like tagged token arrays, right? So we have like, this is um, this token here. So we have token. And then this is this section here is a different node in the syntax tree. So instead of storing this, we store a pointer down to another thing that's like, oh yeah, we've got two tokens, right? And then we have some kind of annotation that's like, this is an array. And these are the tokens. Um, and this is also an array. And these are the tokens. So we have like child nodes are tokens, right? And then we have the comma and then some white space. And then true is not part of the array. So we have a pointer down to true. Um, and this is a, this is the true, like this is the token form of true. This is just true as a string. Um, so we still need to annotate this with like, hey, this is the value true. Um, and then finally we finish up with the closing bracket. Um, and now, like this format of storing a syntax tree, we can still get all the children, right? Because we know the tree structure, but we're also explicitly storing all of the formatting information, right? Because we could have, um, uh, we could store the white space as a token. Uh, and then this would be, like, I, I think this is the ideal format, like right now. Um, because it fits all of the things. It, uh, it was, well, so firstly, it's very flexible, right? Because we could parse, I, I, okay, it's maybe too flexible because we could parse incorrect stuff. Um, but the thing, yeah, uh, like it has annotations, right? Which is all we need in order to like insert an array. Um, all you need is a like, hey, what's the default array? Um, and that will spit out an empty set of brackets. And um, well, yeah, we, we can, we still know like where, what the rep, the tree representation is, but we still have the text, right? And we could just turn this back into text by literally just flattening all of this tree structure back into one string of tokens, right? Like what we're doing at the moment. I wonder if this is the way forward. Um, what, what do other people think? Have I like failed to scroll down or something? No. Um, am I? Uh, so, n uh, Hmm. So basically, like, I, I, I think the sections of the file uh, is basically like that tokenization, right? Which is that you, you read some text and you split the text into chunks. Um, so, for example, uh, you, we have some JSON that's like, uh, oh, what was this JSON? It was this. And let's say we, we instead of putting a new line, we just put a load of spaces. Um, and the tokenizer will go and start splitting this up into chunks. So it'll be like, hey, um, this bracket is a chunk, and then this bracket is a chunk, and so on. Hmm, okay. I mean, like, I I'm not sure would, with the edits, the change formatting rules work with this representation. Well, so I think we need, we need a default formatting style, right, which is that, like, if someone adds Oh yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, no. Um, but the thing is, I I think we should store the entire syntax tree representation. Um, I mean, like probably you could gain some performance by uh, kind of like lazily evaluate, like lazily parsing. But I'm not sure because like so, tree sitter takes fifty milliseconds to parse a file completely, and. Uh, 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. This is one issue with streaming in general is that like the bandwidth from me to the viewers like is really big because I'm videoing. Um, I mean, like I think what I want to avoid more than having the best possible representation of syntax trees is I want to avoid multiple representations of syntax trees, right? Like whatever we need to decide, whatever we decide on, we should have one one structure and that should be it. Uh, because like it will just be, like, the more code you have, um, but, um, Maybe I'm not sure I understand what the the original point was. I, I'm like I, I'm not saying you're wrong, right? Like I I still uh, I I don't think that means that you're wrong. I'm just not sure what what you're getting at, right, Electra? I mean, what I what ideally have is precisely one fully expanded AST representation, and that's what the user edits. Um, Oh, okay, right, so for that, JSON. Um, in fact, I'll, for the, um, I can just type this out. Oh, so your, so your point is that, like, you could, um, split the code up into, like, hey, here's a chunk, and here's a chunk, and then, the the root node is this entire chunk, um, and yeah. So I mean, this this does kind of work. This is like you're parsing, but but yeah. The thing is, I'm not sure how well this works with incorrect files. Um, yeah. I mean, like why. Oh wait, what what's going down? I'm I, it, it's really difficult to like actually run a conversation with YouTube's like stream delay. Um, uh, well, so my my idea is that you would have um, uh, you would have some kind of node that would be just like invalid, um, and then you would parse the vast majority of your code successfully. And then if there was a syntax error and the syntax error could be contained somehow, um, then it would replace the section that it wanted to parse with like, this is invalid, but I know this was a statement or whatever. Um, and so then you could go into text mode and edit that. Um, because kind of like how Rust has unsafe, right? I kind of want some kind of fallback. Um, well, yeah, so the thing about Jitsi, Jitsi is cool, but the thing is, I, I think it would get, it would get really chaotic. Um, definitely, yeah, so I, I use Jitsi for, like, meeting out with friends and stuff, but the thing is, live streams are more like, like, I want the VODs to hang around afterwards. Because on one level, it's like, oh, I want to know what other people think. Um, and on the other hand, it's like, well, I want some kind of history of the project to be around later. Um, so it's kind of like making devlogs, except that I'm not. Um, and normally the point of, like, live streaming was to, like, me do some code and people watch. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, Thing is, I'm a bit nervous about just like suddenly opening like a Discord chat or something. Like Discord would be the other option. Um, I'm a bit worried about doing that. Um, although it would be uh, kind of useful. Maybe, maybe would it be useful? Yeah, I, I think it probably would be once like a sapling starts like moving forwards. Um, like I, I think it would be useful for like the core core developers to like talk about stuff. Um, 
that that is an interesting idea. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure whether you'd get so many people as well, right? Because um, it it would definitely be a different experience to watching a live stream, right? Because I think there are quite a few people who will just turn up. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, maybe I should create a Discord for it. Um, the thing is that I'm not sure. So <laughs> the thing is, I I have an issue with like, make, like having ideas and then starting projects and enough of my ideas are good or look good at, at first sight, right? That <laughs> I keep making projects and then having to maintain them, right? Um, so I end up with quite a lot on my plate, and I mean, I guess that's not that's not an issue. Um, but yeah, no, okay. I I, th I think having a sapling Discord would be cool. Um, but the thing is, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, like, why not? Why not? Um, although I don't have the time to moderate a Discord. Um, that's the other thing. I mean, I could definitely, yeah, I, I could definitely set that up. Because it, it would be useful to have, like, more discussions about how sapling works. Right. Um... The thing is, like, ideally, I would have enough time, like, ideally, Sapling would be my only project, and I would have, like, university work during term, and that would be it. Um, but the thing is, I have quite a lot of other projects, um, projects with users as well, right? Like, people are using my projects in the wild, and I need to maintain them. Ah, uh, yeah. Um... Because the thing is, I think having public recorded, uh, like, I, I think that's a good idea, but not necessarily given how young the project is, right? Because um, I'm not sure how much, like, ideas are only so much use at this point, if that makes sense. I'm not sure, like, I, I, I'm not meaning that in, like, uh, no one should have ideas and share them, right? It's just that at this point, there needs to be like a core of sapling, a core of sapling needs to have been made um, before I think it's wise to have lots of... I, I, I have no idea what the value in public VODs is, um, except that people seem to like it, I don't know. Um, how finished is sapling? Well, it's kind of... Um, hold on, I can just run it. Um, in fact, let's get reset. No. Uh, yeah, let's set this. Let's set this back to false so we get proper syntax highlighting. Um, that should be right. Okay, yeah, cargo run. Um, yeah, so sampling is very unfinished. But basically, it's like, um, kind of the core of it is done, like the whole concept of syntax tree editing. Um, so we have a syntax tree, and we have a single cursor that we can move around. Um, uh, and on the right there, oh wait, th this pointing won't work. Um, but on the right, oh, this will. Um, uh, on the right, we have a, like, it shows you what I'm typing. Basically, which obviously won't be, like, there's no point having that in a text editor, but because I usually stream quite, quite a lot, um, that I figured that was useful. Um, so, yeah, so you can do this, and we can do, like, uh, useful things. Like, let's say we wanted an array here. We can press RA and then replace with an array, right? And then uh, we could insert into a true and then... Uh, let's say, I, I, I don't know, let's insert after um, four falses or something, right? So a fair amount of it. Uh, 
the current representation not I mean, yeah, so using the mouse cursor is sort of a little bit against the initial... No, like, so, I, yeah. Um, like, it can, obviously. Like, you could just cache that. Um, that would be relatively straightforward. Um, and, like, because if you think about it, if we can map, um, there are only so many, like, cells on the screen, right? And so if we can map locations in the syntax tree to locations on the screen, right? So like we can figure out what the cursor is over. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so we can say, hey, this section here, like this curly bracket, uh, sorry, square bracket is part of this array, right? If we can do this, then it's only a matter of keeping a cache of where all of these cells are and what they belong to. And then if I put my mouse over this and click on it, um, then I can click and go, boom, it's here. Because we looked up, we know where this was printed and we know what it came from. So then if we just keep a reverse lookup whenever we just update the screen. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think if we can map um, positions on the AST to screen space, then we can do the opposite. That's relatively straightforward. Um, and it wouldn't be too much of an issue because currently a display, um, like the display encode is different to the internal representation. Um, so we could just make a thing that's like, like, we have a kind of buffer in front of the AST itself that is like the user facing stuff. Um, and so we could just insert into that space, just a, the cache, right? Cursor optional as in the mouse cursor or, um, Uh, no. Um, well, so I, I, I think the whole, like, we will, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's a good idea to parse only part of the, um, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm not, um, I'm not going to make it compulsory to use the mouse. Um, because the thing is, like, uh, on the GitHub repo, it says, um, Yeah, so the thing is, the, the, the thing I have an issue with, right, is that syntax trees are great, but they tend to be fairly branchy. Like, you tend to have two cases, right? You either have syntax trees that are very branchy, like you have, um, I don't know, if I open some Rust code, it will have, like, you'll have one block with, I don't know, maybe, a, like, a hundred elements inside it, right? And those are statements, right? You'll have loads and loads of branches of children in a block, and then you'll have like, I don't know, some expression and that expression will be really deep, right? So we've got an issue that like syntax trees can be quite big two dimensionally, right? They can be very wide and they can be very tall, uh, very deep. So some kind of naive navigation uh, is going to be horrendously slow, right? Like if you can only move to an adjacent bit in the tree at any one time, then getting from like the bottom of a really deep expression to the, the um, like, I don't know, the statement next to it is going to be a nightmare. And it might just be easier to pick up the mouse and click on the statement you want to jump to, right? Like, I, I think in this scenario, um, that might be a case, or we implement Vim's uh, text searching, right? Because if we can convert it to text, um, then I could be like slash true, uh, and then it would, it would jump. Um, Yeah, no, I'm definitely not, um, I, I don't plan on making a text editor. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see a reason why that wouldn't be the case, right? Like, I'm kind of intending that Sapling's code base will be kind of like... But why, why, why is it a problem, right? Because... Um, right, because, so, here's the thing, like, I don't think you ever need to map source code positions back to the AST, right? Because if we go back to our representation here, um, like, when we parse a text file, we parse it to this, right? 
Um, how could you find the correct positions? Well, we don't, we can't select regions of text, right? Um, we're displaying the syntax tree nodes to the user, right? So if I clicked on this, um, we know where in this text buffer um, we viewed it, right? But imagine, imagine I made some really big JSON, right? Like I inserted, uh, inserted 50, no, insert 50 trues, right? So I made some ridiculously big thing, right? And this has gone way off the bottom. Um, and like, yeah, we're way off the end here. But imagine I scrolled down, right? We, the user can't click on, oh, oh yes, Vim's text search would work really badly. Um, yeah, it would. That's just something like we need to figure out basically. Like, um, but I'm not sure, like what you'd ideally want because sapling is like, the, like the whole point of sapling is to um, do syntax tree, uh, like it is a syntax tree editor, like the primary way of editing, like the primary mode of interaction should be um, with the syntax tree. So ideally we'd have some kind of way of searching the syntax tree. Um, and that would be like independent of white space, which would be cool. Um, in fact, I think there is, there is grasp, I think, ah, JavaScript structural search, um, which is uh, like, yeah, which is basically this, right? You have some kind of way of searching for code. So you can be like, let's find all of the, amp the ands and it will, it will find them. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that's definitely possible, but like, you know. I, I think that this this representation here um, holds the most promise right now. Um, from like a, how many different things we need from. Uh, yeah, so. But if we have to, like, if we make an edit, then, like, edits is just a clone with, like, we clone the text and then we, we clone only the stuff up to the root. Um, so I'm not sure. To be fair, I'm getting pretty tired. I've been streaming for, like, two hours. Um, and I haven't had dinner yet. Um... I don't know. I think I'm going to start. I'm going to start stopping to make sense soon. Um, but yes. Yeah, so, well, but the other thing is that Grasp can cheat by storing text locations. That's true. But the thing is, we're not editing the text. We're editing the syntax tree. So all we actually need to know are the syntax tree locations, right? Um, because that's what we'll be modifying. And what I'd really love is some version of like Kakaoan's multiple cursors. Um, and, but for syntax trees, right? So you can select multiple sub trees at a time. Um, Cause imagine like one of the things that Grasp says, if we go back to the thing, is that it's like, you can do complex replacements where it's like, um, replace some kind of, uh, I, I guess this is by as binary operator. Right. So we could do some kind of like, we want to do this find and replace, but actually let's say I selected, um, instead of like the search, we have um, search within the tree that we're editing right now. So I could have, uh, I, I, I could have some JavaScript, uh, some JSON, and I'll select the root. And let's say I wanted to find all the falses, then I'd be like slash for search false or slash F because F is the name character for false. Um, and then it would move, it would search down the tree and be like, oh yeah, there's a false here. And then there's a false here. And it would select them both at the same time. And now we'd have two cursors. And then whatever we did to one cursor also happens to the other. So we could be like, um, uh, we would be, I, I don't know, search downwards. I think it's S in Kakorin. 
but it would be like S, search, S for search downwards, um, F for false, and then it would, it would pick up all of these. Um, and then we could be like, replace true at the end. Re replace true. And instead of copying the root, you know, it would like replace true in here and then replace true as well. And I think that would be really flexible because at this point we don't need, like, we don't need all of the like Vim's thing about like the delete command being really complicated because it takes arguments. Um, like that's just not a thing. You just do the movement and then delete. Um, and it frees up tons and tons of uh, keyboard shortcuts as well because we don't need, um, like, so it gives us the operations that we have in Vim that's like, oops, the wrong thing. Um, if we want to like delete, um, delete inside square bracket, right? We can do that. Um, but in Kakaoon, oh, do we not have Kak installed? Uh, pseudo Pacman Kakaoon. Yeah, please install. Okay, excellent. It worked. Um, uh, so cat config rs. Um, if we go down here, then a curly. Excuse me. Oh, it's alt a curly brace. Um, oh, it's alt i. Sorry, uh, alt i curly brace, and then delete. Um, which is kind of cool, right? Because now. Um, we can also do stuff like, um, let's say I wanted to replace all of these um, with, uh, like, I, I, I don't know, let's say I wanted to replace these with arrows, but with a, um, a, a dash rather than equals. Then I could do um, alt i curly brace and then refine the search to this and then uh, and now I've got a whole load of cursors, which are actually like a whole load of selections. So now I could do delete and insert, and then I could insert the things, and then go out of insert mode, and then what is it? Space to go back to one selection. Um, and that's just like oh, that, that I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I I like I, I'm not sure if you've gained any power there, but like. Uh, oh yeah, so if someone if someone makes a PR for Windows support, I'm more than happy to do it. But the thing is, I don't use Windows myself, and I don't develop on Windows, um, and so I, I just don't know how to do it. Um, that's the thing. Um, also, if you do, if you are into making a PR for Windows support, then you need to target uh, TUI Kit instead of Sapling, um, because if you go to the repo, uh, can't go to Tommel. We're using TUI kit here to do the terminal support. And that's, uh, I'm guessing, right, this is because you tried to compile on Windows, right? I'm guessing, and it failed. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the failed compilation happens because TUI kit doesn't work. Um, and TUI kit is just like, uh, where's TUI kit? What about? Oh no. Uh, no, search all of GitHub, please. No, no, TUI kit. Does this work? Oh, it's lot about. Here we go. So this this is the repository that we'd need the PR to. Um, and in fact, there is an issue, I think. Um, doesn't compile on Windows. Here we go. Uh, yeah, because it uses a load of Unix stuff, basically. Um, why did someone copy the entire contents? <laughs> okay, right. So you have like this giant error message. It's like, no, it won't. Um, yeah, this is much more useful, but. Oh, I hadn't seen this cross terminal. It does look good to be fair. Um, But the, the nice thing about um, TUI kit over cross term or something like this, 
um, is that you you basically treat the terminal as a load of cells and then you write to all of the cells and then you refresh the screen um, and then TUI kit handles um, like it, it just handles figuring that out and only using the minimum amount of screen redrawing possible um, so I'm not sure if if someone would want to do Windows support, then I think the alternative would the the way we'd have to do it is to uh, re-implement TUI Kit to be Windows compatible. Does that does that kind of make sense? I'm not sure um, whether or not like any of that's got through. Okay, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it's just, like, one of those things that we'd need to figure out later. Um, also, Kakaoon has the nice, um, uh, it has, like, other nice things that we could, like, uh, you can do something like, I think X is, uh, selects a, new, a line. Oh, yeah, absolutely, like, I'm, I've got no, um, I, I've got no dependence on TUI kit precisely, but if someone made a um, another library that han made a terminal like that, the thing is, like probably long term, we'd want to handle the terminal stuff ourselves, or like have the GUI uh, be pluginable, like uh, NeoVim. The 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 GUI is literally just a plugin, um, and which means that you can do Windows support. Like, you could make a proper GUI for it that doesn't run in a terminal. Um, but you can also have, like, two two different user interfaces, like a GUI version and a terminal version. Uh, and that's okay, because, like, 90% of the code behind it is the same. Um, but, yeah. I don't know. Not much coding has happened, but also... Um, oh, my word. So many, so many people are arriving. This is insane. Um... But, yeah, I don't know, I'd love, yeah, the thing is, like, the issue really is that I, I don't think Sapling is big enough that loads and loads of people could contribute to it at the same time, right? Um, and I think it needs to have a certain amount of, like, just one or two developers working on it um, in order to get it up to a size where you could feasibly have lots of people doing PRs. Um, I know, and also, I, yeah. Yeah, I just wish I had 48 hours in a day. That would be great. Um, but also... Oh, wait, it's, yeah. Uh, I thought I'd been streaming for three hours, but it's okay. It's only two. Um, it's okay. Um... But yeah, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of my voice is getting tired, so I'll I might call the stream here. I don't know if, if I I don't think we can get the refactoring done. And anyway, yeah, I don't know. I think coding on a live stream is not super useful. <laughs> I mean, gotta start small. If we petition to the government for forty eight, then you know. Like, once we get 48 hours, then we can surely extend again. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd be kind of open to the idea of it. Um, like, doing some kind of call, Discord call or something like that, where um, we could, like, discuss stuff. But the thing is, I think... I don't want to fall into the trap of lots of ideas and not very much action. Um, because ideas are only so good. It, like, you need to implement your ideas and test them out. And, um, yeah, I, I don't really, maybe, maybe it would be a good idea to do that and just, like, 
uh, have more people on the project. I think that's going to be, yeah, I, I think that's going to be necessary for the project to continue. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think, I, I, I think this live stream, like, my voice is so tired, I'm going to have to stop. Um, but I think having some kind of discussion would be useful like more open discussion. I'll, I'll look into making a Discord. In fact, I'll, I'll make a Discord um, and that would be cool. Um, it's just like we're kind of locking on, like the issue right now is not the number of ideas that we have. The, the issue is the number of them that can be implemented. Um, maybe just worth at this point having a fresh start on the code base even. Um, and re-implementing, I'm not sure. Although Rust is, I don't know, Rust is very conducive to um, refactoring. So it might be worth refactoring. I don't know, let's see, we could, I'll, I'll make a Discord and I'll, I'm guessing most of the people who are watching this came from Reddit um, and I'll make a, um, I'll probably post in a reply after dinner. So yeah. I mean, yeah, thanks, thanks for everyone for turning out. Um, I've got, like, many more people than usual, so, hey, welcome to everyone new. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what, like, whether or not live stream coding would uh, fit into that. I'm not sure. Maybe it's something I do, I do maybe once a month or something, um, if I had something interesting. The thing is, it's just like watching someone else do something it's just not the most efficient thing on any level, right? Because if I wanted to code, I could code a lot more efficiently off camera. Oh, cool, I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Um, like, I, I, I've enjoyed like live streaming as well. Um, it's cool, it's definitely like, I, I don't know, I was very, very frightened the first a couple of live streams <laughs> were, were really scary. Um, but I've now just like got over my fear of cameras, I think. Um, and now it's fine. So even if like, even if I just stop live streaming at this point, like I, I still think there's a place for very open discussion. Um, but yeah, I think Discord is probably the better option at this point. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, but I've got to go at some point, right? Like um, this is peak, peak viewers as well. And I feel like, you know, I should keep going. But also, uh, it's like 9 p.m. here, and I haven't had dinner yet. Um, I mean, you can join the Discord if you want. Like, that, that would be um, a thing. Because if, if there's one thing... Uh, so, for the time being, like, uh, I was going to reply to my post on Reddit, um, and with the link. That's what I would do, I think. Um, but I think, ah, oh, I'm, I'm really unsure about opening a Discord and then having to moderate it. <laughs> food is definitely good. And it's probably good food as well because I'm at home and I like home home rather than a uh, student house. So <laughs> the food is a lot better um, as my mum is really good at cooking. So yeah, the, the, the only worry I have with Discord is that it should probably be moderated in some way. Um, and I don't really have the time to moderate a Discord. Um, we could probably sort that out. Um, it, 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 like, yeah, I probably should um, moderate the Discord. I mean, like how difficult can it be? It's just like, so long as the, I mean, moderating, like, it just needs to, like, I, I, I don't want to draw the comparison between, like, Minecraft Anarchy servers and Discords, but the real issue with Discords is that, like, you know, that, like, the best Discord for this kind of project is one that's completely open, right? Because that's the whole point of open source, like, there's no point having a, a private Discord. Um, it, it just won't be very useful, but also, um, yeah, like, 
it, it depends how much content there is. Basically, like moderation is literally just, oh, hey, we have, uh, like it is basically just being there to kick people out if people are behaving badly. Um, yeah, it, it's just like, yeah, okay, I'm probably being overly paranoid about this, but the thing is, I don't want like just some randomer to just turn up and like wreck the joint, you know? Um, yeah, okay, let's give it a go. Like, you know, the worst that happens is that we make a discord. Um, yes, yes, definitely. I'm, I'm much more on the like paranoid about people. Cause the thing is like, at the end of the day, uh, like a everything fundamental, like we're humans, right? Like fundamentally the things we do revolve around people, right? Like making software is all very well, but like if I'm reviewing some code, right? Like by far the most important thing to me is like the person whose code I'm reviewing, right? Because I like, I just don't want to offend people, right? Like if I review some code and really offend the person that I'm reviewing the code of, like I might get better code, but I've just offended the person, right? So the people, like people are really important to me basically is the upshot. And that sounds, that sounds really cringy and cliche, but it is. And like, I don't, so I'm therefore overly paranoid, paranoid about things like moderation because moderation is just all about making a, a like making a space feel safe. Right. Even if literally the moderators do nothing because the place is already safe. It's just like that there is a safety net that's like if something like if shit hits the fan. Right. We can do something about it and not have to just like shut everything down because um, someone's wrecking the joint. Right. Like that's basically it. I mean, it's fine. I, I it depends how much talking happens. Right. Um, oops. Wrong thing. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll do. So I think, um, for, for my money, right? Like, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have food now. So I'm going to finish this and then eat. And then after that, I'll work on making a discord. I need to get discord on my PC and my phone as well, if I'm going to do that. And particularly if I'm going to be a moderator, because, um, I need to know about stuff. And then I, once I do that, then I'll comment on my Reddit post, which I guess Uh, well, yeah, so I, I, I think removing certain people, like, having the power to, rem like, okay, so moderation is only as good, like, moderation without a terms of service, and, like, a, a, a code of conduct. Basically, if you're going to do any kind of moderation, you need a code of conduct, because, um... Oh, cool, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> having... Having too many people supporting your project is, like, absolutely a nice problem to have. Um, I mean, yeah, cool. In which case, like, I'll I'll probably, like, I don't know, because out of, like, sampling is kind of my project, even though it's not 100% my idea, um, like, I'll probably be admin or whatever to, uh, to start. Um, just, yeah, uh, like, it, it's not that I don't trust you per se, like, like whoever else it was, uh, like would be making admin. Um, I know it doesn't matter. We can cross this bridge when it comes to it. Um, and for now I need some food. I'm really hungry. Um, so yeah, thanks to everyone who's turned up. Like it, it's been fun. Hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, I'll post the, um, I'll post a link to the Reddit on, no, Discord on Reddit, okay, and we'll see how it goes, um, let, let, yeah, let's see what happens. So with that, I think I'm going to head off, so um, I think I will stream next week anyway, or at least if I do decide to do some other thing with the streaming, I'll make a video, right, so I won't just suddenly disappear. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll see you some, oh, yo, no, wait, I'll see you guys on the Discord, hopefully, um, 
but yeah, that, the thanks, thanks you guys for turning up. Um, oh, I've got loads of me's. Ooh. Oh, there's a fun thing you can do, which is like, do this. Uh, which is kind of cool. Anyway, <laughs> that, that's just a bit of fun. So yeah, that, yeah, end of stream. Bye. So, uh, yeah, see you guys next week or on the Discord. That will be...